Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. I am sure that you enjoyed the previous presentation by Oki Met of HHS. And now we have Mr. Scott Brayer. He's the Acting Deputy Assistant Director of Infrastructure Security at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, as we most commonly know it. Mr. Brayer currently serves as the Acting Deputy Assistant Director for Infrastructure Security with Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. In this role, he helps lead CISA's efforts to secure the nation's critical infrastructure in coordination with government and the private sector. And key areas of focus include vulnerability, risk assessments, securing soft targets in crowded places, training and exercises, and securing high-risk chemical facilities. Mr. Breyer is a member of the Senior Executive Service. He was a Senior Executive Fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. He received a Master of Arts in National Security Studies and in Homeland Security and Defense from the Naval Postgraduate School and received a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Oklahoma. In addition, he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from the Citadel. I'll give you now Mr. Scott Greer. Thank you, Joyce. And it's absolutely, absolutely a pleasure to be here. Um, say good morning. I'm sure for some of you, it's, it's good afternoon now that we're in this uh, virtual environment and I'm sure folks are Joining from uh, all over the uh, all over the nation. Um, as you look behind me, you can see that I am not in my office. Uh, I've actually been working in, in this uh, remote work environment, as we like to call it, um, since April timeframe. Matter of fact, our whole workforce has been in this situation, uh, which I will speak to because I think it um, is right in line with the uh, the title of uh, my remarks today. Uh, as Joyce stated, I'm in the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at the Department of Homeland Security. And specifically, uh, right now, I am the uh, Deputy um, Acting uh, Deputy Assistant Director for Infrastructure Security. Um, in that capacity, um, our mission basically is to save lives and uh, protect uh, critical infrastructure. Um, today, I'd like to uh, speak to uh, everyone, um, one, about uh, the mission of uh, our agency. Uh, what we have done to help secure communities uh, during uh, this COVID-19 COVID environment that we're presently in, and how we are adjusting our activities uh, to meet customer requirements, um, knowing that you know, we might now be in what most people refer to as, uh, you know, when are we going to have the uh, return to normalcy? I always look at every day as being the new normal. So, so this environment might be here for months, years, uh, just unknown. So therefore we're, uh, we're adjusting our, our um, business processes to our program so we can uh, deliver products, resources, and tools to our stakeholders. And also, uh, really this is what I'll, I'll begin with because uh, I think it's in line with the title of this presentation. Uh, what we have learned from um, executing work from home um, with our workforce. Uh, it's like many of you, um, back around April, May timeframe, uh, facilities you were in were shut down. Uh, folks went to a remote work, and then um, with that, it, uh, you really had to make uh, certain adjustments. Uh, first, a little background about Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, which I'll excuse me, which I'll refer to um, today as CISA, um, uh, Charlie India Sierra Alpha. Um, uh, Perfect acronym, and since I'm in, in government and formerly in the military, I love acronyms. Um, at CISA, our mission is to uh, defend against the threats of today while working with partners across all levels of government and in the private sector to secure against the evolving risk of tomorrow. Basically, we, we frame that as a bumper sticker, uh, defend today, secure tomorrow. At CISA, we solve problems by providing technical assistance security information and education, assisting with training and exercises of best practices and providing mitigation measures, uh, which has been a, a big focus during uh, COVID-19. Uh, bottom line, we consider ourselves to be the nation's risk advisors. Our stakeholders own the risk, so they must manage it. Uh, so we work every day to help them build their security and resilience capacity. And since most of our work is voluntary, our programs, tools, and resources must bring value. 
Um, you know, as stated, we just advise on what the risk is. The owners and operators actually have to do mitigation. So our products, tools, and resources really need to hit the mark. We want, like all of you, a secure and resilient infrastructure for the American public. Secure and resilient infrastructure for the American public is a tall order. So how do we set that course? Uh, well, right now, we have established five strategic priorities uh, within Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. The first one, China supply chain and 5G. The persistent threat posed by China compels CISA to focus on supply chain risk management in the context of national security. That's strategic priority one. Strategic priority two is coming up here in just a couple of weeks, election security. Our objective is to reduce the likelihood of compromises to election infrastructure confidential confidentiality integrity and availability, which are essential to the conduct of free and fair democratic society. Third, soft target security. Prior to April, this was on the, the forefront of everybody's minds. With, now that we're remote work, a lot of facilities are now just coming online, especially the public gathering locations. Um, it's been in the backdrop for most people but it's still a major priority of ours. This is a daunting security challenge if you just think about the multitude of public gathering locations just in your community. But we will continue to support our partners to identify, develop, and implement innovative and scalable measures to mitigate the risk at public gathering locations. Fourth strategic priority, federal cybersecurity. Our authorities in this area present the capability an opportunity to create federal cybersecurity approaches that address the speed of change in the cyber world. And lastly, industrial control systems. Much of our critical infrastructure share a common characteristic, dependencies on industrial control systems. We lead the federal government's unified effort to work with the ICS community to reduce risk and control systems. But these priorities were established at the start of the fiscal year in 2020. Then came the pandemic. Naturally, our first step, like I'm sure many of you and, and where, where you work, was to take care of our employees. Initially, we had a smooth transition with moving our workforce to remote work. Our agency has always taken uh, the continuity of operations very seriously. All of our employees, when they're hired and brought on board, are, are given laptop computers. We did away with desktops years ago. Uh, in this manner, um, if something was to happen, um, you know, yes, we work in DC, Washington, DC, snowstorm, for example. Um, we don't lose uh, our capabilities. Our, our folks can work from home. So whether it's a snow event or whether it's an exercise uh, that we do each year, um, we've always taken this seriously. seriously. So it was actually a, a very, easy transition for us to go to remote work. But the initial shift to remote work um, and we limited our facility footprint to essential workers was pretty easy. After about a day or two, uh, it was totally different when you don't know the end state. Uh, whether it's a snowstorm in DC, you have an idea that after 48 hours, 72 hours, uh, that the facility is going to be back up and you're going to return, return to normal activities. And the environment that you were in would be remaining the same. We did not have that in the COVID environment. Um, we did not know what the end state was. We still don't know what the end state is. So compounding that along with folks now being at home, now being at home in different situations, school closings, whether uh, daycares, closing, or now also your spouse is working from home. Things you did normally throughout the day, whether visit a gym, a uh, gym is now closed, uh, restaurants closed, uh, all the things that you might have enjoyed that would give you that perfect work-life balance aren't there anymore. So with that change, with the change in operating posture, which was easy, quickly became a change of an operating environment which was a, a bit challenging for us to get our arms around. So that we can ensure that our employees uh, were, really had that 
you know, balanced frame of mind and could continue to work in a very effective and efficient manner. So as a leadership team, it was much more than just knowing what the dependencies and interdependencies of your activities within the key functions. What policies, processes, and protocols we need to put in place to ensure a high level of performance? And can your IT tools support the processes? Those are very easy items to, to tackle. Uh, what was more difficult was leaders need to evaluate and understand, is the employee, and I'm not saying the workforce, is the employee comfortable with protocols that are being implemented? What are the employee's health and safety concerns for themselves and for their families? COVID, still a lot of unknown uh, items around that. What personal demands is the employee now experiencing? Mentioned childcare, they could have elderly living at home, which is an at-risk population um, and, and other concerns. Does the employee have space at home to support long-term remote work? What is the performance history of the employee? And what track and support mechanisms need to be put in place to ensure that they are productive? Bottom line, we needed to think and perform differently. We needed to maintain a holistic view and link and leverage the efforts of the whole organization to achieve unity of purpose and effort. To achieve this, we first made great efforts to communicate up and down and across the organization. Next was to communicate this, after the communication, this was then followed by establishing mechanisms uh, to ensure that the communication was consistent. Uh, we wanted to uh, ensure that, uh, really in a sense that we over communicated, um, but there's a fine balance to that. And I'll get to that point in a minute. But the communications, it's not just a matter of setting meetings and talking, they need to be effective. Um, I think it's good to always reinforce the way forward and what we need to do. Need, you know, try to put out there what is the goal, what is the objective, uh, to give something for the employee to strive towards. And the value of why we are doing it. Uh, we produced a lot of good things. We're still producing good things um, while we're in this remote work. And I think they provide uh, great value. Uh, to our stakeholders, and I'll cover those towards the end of my remarks. And the communication that you have, uh, as you as you recall, I stressed employee, has to be a conversation. This will also help inform the frequency. Um, as you really get to understand and know uh, what the needs are uh, of your employees in this new environment, uh, then with that, you can be able to set what is the right ops tempo, if you will, of when you need to communicate to that employee. And you also uh, need, in many senses, to be informal. So you can understand the, the true personal demands, issues that the employee has. Um, when I interact with my employees, um, I am not a, a deputy assistant director. Um, I'm Scott Brewer. And, uh, and that's the way uh, they speak to me. Uh, that is what I, I ask for, and that's what I appreciate. Uh, and lastly, the communication uh, that you have with employees needs to relay clear expectations. This is important because after communication, you need to focus on accountability. Uh, we, we're all in this challenging environment, um, but you know, bottom line, we do have a mission to do. We do have functions uh, that we need to execute by act, through activities. And uh, we need everybody um, working uh, within those activities. Uh, with respect to accountability, uh, nothing happens until someone expects something of you in ways you can achieve. Remote or not, employees can be only be accountable for what's expected of them. And to hold remote workers accountable, managers must provide clear and collaborative expectations. So you have communication, you have accountability. Uh, but then you, you realize that one size doesn't fit all. And hopefully that will come through as you have the one-on-one -on -one communications, the informal communications, and you can understand the needs of the, the employee. You're going to have to individualize to optimize your workforce. Um, for example, you might have employees, as I stated, might have elders or, or, or children at home. I put out to all of our workforce, 
it's expected that if you're going to come in today being like for example a friday and you're going to you're going to log in because you're remote work and you're going to work eight hours it's not expected that you're going to work eight straight hours it's expected that you're going to work eight hours that day um, so therefore if you if you need to take a break um, if you need to do something to help um, whether you have children at home and they're in virtual learning and having issues yeah you can do that that is fine and 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 then with that when uh, whether response to emails or responses to text um, don't expect Im immediately replies you know we anticipate that folks could be uh, doing other things and, and I find that to be a um, a good policy uh, for the workforce um, so that that gives you uh, you know a, a good understanding um, you know it has to be you have to communicate um, you have to set the expectations hold them accountable and you have to individualize um, how you put that in place um, I can't tell you you know we made we've made mistakes along the way um, uh, initially you know the first out of the shoot was communicate first policy was over communicate to ensure that we're we're tied together um, but then but then with that that over communication was actually adding stress to the workforce so we actually set a um, no meeting Wednesday um, policy uh, so therefore every Wednesday you know folks don't have to get on zoom or MS teams or a conference call uh, they can focus on their task at hand um, so as an agency, what actions uh, did we take uh, to adapt, knowing that uh, we are now in, in COVID-19? And um, give you an example, one of the one of our uh, probably most sought after programs is our active shooter workshops. Uh, those are in person. Uh, those typically have about 150 people and we can typically do about 35 a year. Um, now we can't do in person workshops. So so how are we going to make adjustments to that? Um, we knew uh, from studies uh, by the FBI and also from the Secret Service National Threat Assessment Center that if you went back and looked at all the mass attacks, active shooters, there was, there was one common thread in all of them. All of the individuals had a major stressor in life. Um, my thought at the start of COVID-19 was that this was the perfect storm, if you would, with respect to major stressors. Many folks were experiencing loss of work, um, then therefore financial issues. Um, and then we, when it's always raised by many, just the isolation of the stay at home orders that many states had in place and, and even now, because you might be in a um, a group that is at risk, you, you might still be in isolation. Therefore, uh, we knew that we needed to get that message out to specific stakeholders that had experienced the um, vast majority of the hate crimes uh, that we've seen uh, across the nation. Uh, but first and foremost, um, knowing where we were in April, May, in the spotlight, um, if you will, was on public health and their response to the scenario. Um, we thought it best to reach out to the public health community first. And we partnered with the FBI and Health and Human Services uh, to send a tri seal letter to the public health facilities. Uh, one, to thank them uh, for their outstanding efforts, uh, but to remind them of, uh, of security measures. Um, and with that, we published a security and resilience guide for counter improvised explosive devices. Uh, for healthcare stakeholders. We also sent a letter to faith-based organizations, knowing that faith-based organizations, um, like many other facilities were closed, uh, we knew that eventually uh, the stay-at-home orders would be lifted, um, the various levels within communities would be, would be raised um, or lowered depending on how they establish those, and faith-based organizations, houses of worship could uh, then allow their congregations to come in. Um, we wanted to, to remind them that now during uh, this period would be a good time to take a look at their security practices in their security plans. Uh, we also released an essential critical infrastructure workforce guidance. Um, 
this, this guidance uh, advisory uh, sought to identify through analysis and coordination with the government coordinating councils and sector coordinating councils, uh, which is a, uh, a partnership framework that we have that's defined in the National Infrastructure Protection Plan. Um, want to identify those critical infrastructure sectors, workers, and functions that should continue to work safely during COVID-19. This is really just a tool that state and locals could use as they work through the state of home orders um, to uh, you know, identify uh, those sectors that uh, actually need to have uh, employees uh, in, in, in about uh, the communities. In addition, uh, CISO is providing a one-stop shop of cybersecurity and critical infrastructure resources from across federal, private sector, and international partners to raise their security posture in this new landscape. For example, we published a CISA Insights document, Risk Management for, for COVID-19, uh, which provides executives a tool to help them think through the physical supply chain and cybersecurity issues that may arise for the spread of COVID-19. We also published uh, CISA Interim Telework Guidance, which focuses on remote federal employees connecting to private agency networks and cloud environments in a secure manner. We published CISA Tabletop Exercise Package, uh, which was developed to assist the private sector and stakeholders and critical infrastructure owners and operators to assess short-term, immediate, and long-term recovery and business continuity plans related to COVID-19. That's just an example of, of, of some of the items that we were able to uh, push out to our stakeholders. We also provided cyber threats and COVID-19 alerts uh, that were produced in collaboration with domestic and foreign partners. Some of our more recent alerts included Chinese targeting of COVID-19 research organizations, cyber warning for key healthcare organizations in the UK and the US, COVID-19 exploited by malicious cyber actors, which was a joint UK and US alert, an enterprise VPN security alert, uh, which basically encourages organizations to adopt a heightened state of cybersecurity when considering alternate workplace options for their employees. Finally, as a nation that had pivot to not only remote work, but remote learning, CISA is supporting the nation as we adapt and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic by developing and widely sharing telework best practices to ensure security and resilient workspaces and classrooms. To address the increased risk introduced by expanded telework in the COVID-19 pandemic, CISA has built an online center of excellence for telework in the federal government, addressing an array of issues, including remote patching, secure sensitive and proprietary data, and incorporating virtual collaboration tools. All these um, tools, resources can be found at, at CISA.gov. So I welcome all of you to uh, please uh, take a look at those and, and see what could bring value to your, your workplace. Um, and, and then with that, we made really a, a concerted effort then to uh, change the way that we deliver products, knowing that uh, we like this series right here, this webinar, are going to be in a virtual environment. Our Office for Bomb and Prevention, which has an extensive uh, virtual instructor led training, uh, basically has doubled down on that, converting many other of their other courses, which are always in person, uh, to the uh, virtual instructor led training. Um, doing that May, April, May timeframe. So if you think that it, it kicked in around June, July, uh, they were able to surpass with respect to students being trained um, in 2020 than what were trained in 2019. And to me, that's that's simply remarkable uh, that we're able to touch so many. So, it, yeah, I, I almost look at the COVID-19. Yes, we're all going through major change. Yes, it's stressful, uh, but there's a silver lining, at least you know, for what we can do with respect to our stakeholders. By modifying our business practices, we're actually able to touch more. And I think that's a, that's a major lesson learned for us. Lastly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our, our active shooter um, program, uh, we taken that eight hour in-person course and have converted that to a, a two hour webinar series. Um, 
with that now just coming in play, uh, the real metric is going to be what who we're able to train numbers wise, uh, the value of that training with respect to those that go through the training uh, in 21, uh, benching that against 2019. Uh, but right now it's projected that we'll be able to train three times uh, as many individuals. In summary, we, we face increasingly sophisticated threats and our employees stand on the front lines of federal government's efforts to defend our nation's federal networks and critical infrastructure. The threat environment is complex, dynamic, and interdependencies that add to the challenge. And needless to say, the COVID-19 is another added layer of challenge to that. As new risk emerge, we as CISA are committed to ensure efforts all made a safe, more secure, and resilient homeland. Through these efforts, we'll be able to defend today and secure tomorrow. And I hope uh, these, these remarks are beneficial to you. If you're working within the COVID environment, um, please communicate to your people, get to know your people as individuals, uh, not necessarily as a quote workforce. And then with that, you'll be able to uh, know how to communicate to them, know how best to set up and hold them accountable for the work and also be able to uh, individualize uh, that communication, that accountability requirements. And, and with that, you'll be able to optimize your workforce. Thank you. Scott, thank you so much for a, a very informative and educational uh, session here. Um, a lot of these things that, you know, you answered all my questions, actually. All the questions were starting to come in. You you were very good at answering all of them. So I just have one question for you because we're running out of time, but this was great. Well, actually, two. Number one, can you repeat that uh, website that people can go to and get additional information? Sure. Yes, CISA.gov, Charlie India Sierra Alpha dot golf Oscar Victor. Okay. And there's uh, Thank you so a lot of material there around cybersecurity uh, and uh, and COVID-19. Great, wonderful. So everybody, please pay attention. If you're, you're wondering about what you should do as far as policies and protocol, this is the great place to go and, and get a lot of that information. And lastly, and you talked a lot about work-life balance and taking mm -hmm. care of your people. So. In any other kind of situation, when you're a caretaker as a leader, how do leaders take care of themselves? <laughs> well, you, you see behind me, uh, one, I, uh, I live in uh, Linden, Virginia, which is about uh, two hours from DC. Um, so that's how I, I take care of myself. So people at work think I'm crazy. Um, I actually get up at 2.30 in the morning um, I've been an equestrian for years, so I uh, school uh, a couple of horses in the morning. Um, I'm back home by 7.30. Um, it's getting hard to do that because now we're riding in the dark, um, but the, the ring is, is lit. Um, and, and then with that, that's my, that's my work, work life balance. And, uh, you know, and I enjoy having those informal conversations throughout the day with employees. Uh, because uh, to me, um, that is uh, one, it, it, it really um, gives me satisfaction um, if I'm talking with someone and uh, they are having difficulties uh, that, you know, maybe I can give them some advice and, and, and try to help. So, um, so with that, that, that that's, my, that's my work life balance. Great. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you at our conference this 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 time, and uh, we look forward to your participating in future opportunities. Uh, we are very much in line with you on the criti 16 critical yeah. infrastructures. In, in fact, we're going to be coming out with a guide uh, with listing all those critical infrastructures and having people contribute to that guide, uh, and we're going to distribute it to um, members of Congress and, and uh, departments and, and administrators in the federal government. Fantastic. Well, thank afternoon. Take care, Joyce. Thank you.